I'm Lukas Chelström from Finland, as Dieter said. And I've been, well, I'm a normal upper secondary school guy in a small town, well, two, uh, 20,000 people, about. Um, and I'm, some of you may know me as the Kubernetes on ARM guy, maybe. Uh, that was my uh, GitHub profile earlier. And uh, after Seattle, uh, I went to KubeCon Seattle as well. Uh, I photographed myself uh, at Space Needle and thought it could be a good, good profi profile picture. Yeah, and I'm um, a second year upper secondary school student, high school for those, if there are anyone from US. And I'm speaking Swedish, although I live in Finland. 300,000 of, of the Finns speak Swedish natively, like me. And I'm a maintainer of Kubernetes since a year back. Uh, I didn't know anything about Docker or Kubernetes two years ago, Not, nothing. And, but, but in May 2015, I got, well, I had one or two Raspberry Pis, and, but, but no Linux computer I could test on. So I, I just, oh, this Kubernetes thing is so cool but I don't have any hardware other than my Raspberry Pis to test it on. So it was simple. I tried to uh, convert Kubernetes to Ras the Raspberry Pi to ARM. It wasn't the easiest task to do for someone really scared of the command line, though. <laughs> but uh, somehow I managed to do it. Also, I've never attended a computing class. This is kind of strange as well. Um, I just jumped on in and did the things I found the most interesting and have, well, on the road I've learned a lot of things. So, oh, what, I, ha, what I, have I been tinkering with then? My first open source project was Kubernetes on ARM and it was the first out of the box solution to run Kubernetes on a Raspberry Pi or on a, a Banana Pro, I think I converted it to, and, and some other ARM boards as well. And I maintained that for eight weeks, uh, eight months or something, uh, un until I got to merge everything into core, which was my original intention, because I wasn't satisfied with having Kubernetes on ARM as a side project. I, I wanted that to be the official, the core functionality of Kubernetes. And I, I'm coming to why this is important later. And um, last year I wrote a multi-platform proposal that was accepted. And it was, it looks like this, you can go and and find it in the Kubernetes slash community repo, uh, along with the other proposals. And it's a, it's a pretty long description of what this is, how it should work, or how it could work, and what Kubernetes projects should do to be compliant with this design. And uh, during the summer last year, I maintained Minikube in the early days of the project. Like from, from this stage it was like one commit, a readme file or something to 0 0.5 I think, or 0 0.6. Uh, and when, when, cube, when SIG cluster lifecycle, uh, a Kubernetes special interest group was formed. I, I switched to, to that, focusing fully on, on that topic, because I found, found it a little bit more interesting when we, have, we can think about scenarios like 5,000 5, nodes, and how do we scale, how do we do AJ, how do we do upgrades, and, and, and so forth. So, uh, yeah, I, I just do the, the things I found I find interesting. So, well, I, I moved on to that one. Why should we 
have the multi-architecture, the multi-platform functionality in Kubernetes then? Well, I, I found the CNCF charter uh, where, where they say what's important to them. And this is a, a direct quote from, from their mission statement. And I, I think this is, I agree fully with this. And this was my intention where, and thought when I, when I started doing this with ARM and, and everything. And I think it's important for the future as well. And I'm also working with the CNCF team. It may be that CNCF gets some, some sponsors and some members that will provide CI infrastructure, for example, or, or other hardware to, to make it to, uh, well, to, to test the automatically run tests and, and so forth. Also, we, we have to um, convert some, some other projects as well. But why is the multi-platform functionality important for Kubernetes? Well, Kubernetes is the kernel of a distributed system. It, it's just the essential things, and then it's easy to, to build on top. And Kubernetes abstracts away the, the nodes in your cluster, and you should only think about your app. Not, not well, do I have three nodes, or do I have 5,000, or so forth. And I also want to have like, I want to be able to make mixed clusters, for example. I, I want to, to have ARM64 hardware. I want to have AMD64, Linux. I want to run some Windows machines, like Stefan showed. It was really great, and, and so forth. So we, we don't know which, plat which platform will be the dominating one in 20 years, or in 30 years, or something. And it may be Intel, or it may be ARM, or it be, may be something that we don't know about yet. Well, so therefore we should play it safe and go with all architectures and diversify the, the Kubernetes ecosystem as well. And by letting new architectures, new platforms join the project, we'll see a stronger project and ecosystem around it and a sound competition between the platforms themselves. So if, if ARM actually, if folk, folks build things for ARM, it will step up the, the competition. There will be a, a fair competition between the architectures then. And we, then, then the technical details will, like, say, uh, will, will show whether one is better than the other for, for certain tasks. And the risk of vendor lock-in on the default platform is significantly reduced. Let's say we, Kubernetes is an Intel-only thing for, for 10 years. During those 10 years, it's, there is quite a significant risk that someone will add a feature that the Kubernetes, the kernel of a distributed system, it, they, they will add some Intel-only functionality. And then if, if someone wants to use it on an ARM board or on an um, ARM 64-bit machine, which is even more powerful than an Intel machine might be, they, they can't, because Kubernetes, the core, isn't like, compatible with, with the, the machine. So therefore, by having from, from the start, by having this available for all platforms is crucial. What could Kubernetes on ARM be used for right now then? Well, there is a 163-page uh, master thesis about this, how to use Raspberry Pis in education. They, two guys from Denmark, Aarhus University, uh, wrote this, and they, they let the students use uh, class, uh, racks of Raspberry Pis, four or five, I don't remember, and they, they, and that way, they, they educated the way Kubernetes works, the way distributed systems works, the way 
um, Java some some applications there works. I don't remember. But anyway, by having the for for a person that has never used distributed systems before, having a, a four machines in front of you and you can touch them, you can draw the power, power cables and see how they react. Then then it get gets really physical and practical and that's I, I would say that's the best way to learn. At least that's that way I learned. And well, <laughs> uh, the the way I, <laughs> the reason I, I'm so, like, know know pretty much about Kubernetes and cross compilation and so forth is because I've failed so many times, like compiling things to my Raspberry Pi. So. I didn't get anything for free when I started doing this, and that way I I couldn't even take the the fast route, the easy route, and that's also important when like dealing with for university students, for example. So that way they will they they will be forced to to actually understand what's going on under the hood. Also, Azure, other vendors, we, we don't know. They, Azure ha hear this, um, this announcement uh, said that they are investigating to, to provide ARM64 machines as well. And, well, we don't know. Maybe ARM catches up. And also this... How many of you have heard of packets? Okay, the the bare metal solution provider, uh, cloud provider, and here we have one of their servers. 96 cores and 128 gigabytes of RAM. You can get that for well half a, a dollar an hour, and that's at, that's really cheap, at least compared to the other. The other type of service, and yeah, it's really fast. I recall someone has uh, ran, run like 90 Minecraft servers simultaneously, or something on that one. That's pretty cool. How can I set up Kubernetes on another architecture? Well, it's pretty easy. First, you have to trust. This time, it's Google, but We'll, uh, we'll make this CNCF wide in the future, eventually. So instead you trust CNCF packages. Now, it, now they are hosted on Google. But anyway, then we add the app to Kubernetes IO repo. We do an update, get upgrade and install kubeadm. Nothing more needed. Then, as usual, kubeadm in it and you'll have your master. This is really what, what what I'm excited about is that Kubernetes should be easy to set up. It should be really straightforward, and Kubeadm could do should do all the the heavy lifting for you. But if you want to to customize things, you are able to do so with a config spec, which I'm gonna uh, show later. Also, here we have an example. Uh, since K uh, Kubernetes, there in Kubernetes there isn't a uh, built-in network provider. There isn't like a, a vendor lock-in here, because again, it's Kubernetes is the core of distributed system. It's not the distro or the like full full provider. But yeah, here we use Weave, for example, and this works on on. AMD 64, ARM 64, and uh, ARM 32-bit. Uh, I, I cross-compiled and, and did, did that work for Weave some, some months ago. So, and now we also have PowerPC 64LE and S390X. I've never used those platforms. I, I barely know what they look like, but Anyway, it's all about diversity. And IBM, someone from IBM stepped up and 
and added S390X. And it was really easy, because once I had refactored the Kubernetes core to like, have, it, have a list of architectures instead of having it hard, -code here, hard coded here and there and so forth. So for that, that PR that came to Kubernetes and I reviewed for S390X was just about like, adding to the list everywhere all references and all images. And yeah, it's, it shouldn't be harder than that to, to set up Kubernetes on PowerPC or whatever, or, or on ARM. And how does this work under the hood then? Well, Kubernetes releases server binaries for all supported architectures. So that the runs a CI job every hour or something that builds all these all Kubernetes binaries for all these platforms. And now, currently, Kubernetes is supported, as you may know, uh, supports Windows for at least Windows nodes, not Windows control plane yet. But it hasn't been a priority. But all binaries are uploaded and available from the CI artifacts. And all Docker images are built and pushed using a semi-standardized make file. So that means there is a kind of a template that these things are the necessary ones for a make file that's multi-arch. Arch. And Debian packages, as you saw above, uh, are provided for all architectures. And it's a really straightforward process. And QBAD, finally, QBADM is aware of which, which architecture it's running on. Uh, while doing kubeadm init, and it just does ev everything for you. And this is a really quick recap. If you want to build something for, for ARM with Go, you just set GoArch to ARM. It's not harder than that. If you, though, if you want to, to build something that has C Go code in it, it's a little bit more complicated, but not so dangerous. Go watch ARM, you have to enable CGO, obviously, and you have to, to point to the right CC compiler. And for example, Hypercube and Kubelet use a CGO code, so this was, uh, we, we had to make these changes and install the, the right CC, GCC binaries. There, then it's also, I'm, I'm able to, to create Docker images for ARM um, on my AMD64 machine, and I have, have made uh, pull requests and commits to the Kubernetes repo. So all releases of Kubernetes includes, like the Hypercube image, is there's a lot of apt-get and, and so forth thing, things in it. And it basically look like, looks like this. Um, um, HF, Debian, Jesse, and then we have to use Kimu as uh, the emulation layer in between, because all Google's hardware that's av available for this is AMD64, and we somehow have to run ARM binaries on the host. So, well, Kimu is used the, as the, the layer in between, and Currently, you have to download and put it inside the container, which makes the ARM, ARM64 variants some megabytes more, more in size. But anyway, this with, with kernel 1.8, uh, 4.8, 4 um, it's possible to, to not use Kimu here. Instead, it should just be on the host. So it's also quite convenient. I don't want to have the architecture in the image name. Well, no one of us wants that. And this is basically a, a recap of what Stefan said. Uh, I didn't know he was going to talk about this as well, but it's cool to have two talks on this topic uh, <laughs> after each other. It's, I think it's important. So. First, we, we build a Go binary, for example. Then we push 
it could be in the in the tag name like Stefan had, or it could be in the uh, image name, the the arch prefix. But anyway, it's well right now. If you have like I have now, I have two up boards, uh, which is Intel, and I have two Odroid C2s and three Raspberry Pi 3s. And one of the Raspberry Pi 3 uh, is using Dita Reuters um, Hypriot OS version for a, uh, ARM64. So this is the, this Raspberry Pi can run ARM64 binaries, and that's cool. So if you have a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster, with like mixed architectures, if you then run something with kubectl. You, you won't be able to know will will this image will this image I just built will it go to Raspberry Pi or will it go to the Odroid or will it go to the upboard? And well, we, we can't know. It's based on the scheduler's dec decisions at runtime. So instead, it would be cool to just say my cool app should be deployed to the cluster, and there it is. So. We can use this. We can do this with manifest lists, and this is basically you can think of it as a redirector. So if the upboard asks for looks at my cool app, it will just well the what's actually happening is that the manifest list is is basically a, a spec that says if you're on uh, uh, or this image this lay these layers are for AMD64, these layers are for ARM, these layers are for ARM64. So it will basically just, the, the Docker client will, will notice that, well, I shouldn't download an AMD64 image if I'm on an ARM machine, and instead I use the ARM variant. And this is, uh, a good documentation on this is on Docker registry version 2, schema 2. And again, manifest tool. As Stefan said, I, I contributed this um, pu push from args command and to make it easy to, to push this. Earlier you had to make a long spec file and uh, you had basically to do a lot of said hacks and temporary files here and there. And yeah, th this command does it for you. And can be used for Windows as well. And how has the Kubernetes road to multi-arch been? Well, version 1.2 1, 1 was the first release I participated in. I, the, the first contribution, the, the first real contribution of my, I made was the inclusion of ARM binaries. So Kubernetes would build ARM binaries on every every CI run. Then in 1.3, I uh, added Docker, so Docker images, with cross-building with Kimu for ARM32 and 64-bit. Also, an interesting thing is that Kubelet, uh, under the hood, uses a pod infra container image, it's called, but it's just an implementation, implementation detail but it is a small C binary, and it also it's required for for pods launching. So earlier, if you were on an ARM machine, the the kubelet would pull an AMD64 binary and try to run it. So it it, it always failed. But well, I, I made it uh, pull pull the right image for the right right architecture. Also. The, every node in Kubernetes now registers itself with the label b.kubernetes.io and OS Linux or Windows and OS uh, or Arch ARM, for example. Then with 1.4, well, Kubernetes was released and it supported ARM out of, out of the box, both for 32 and 64 bits. Uh, unfortunately, one one or two weeks before the release, uh, something in Golang, the implementation, broke, and 
I had to, well, start hacking on Golang and received a, a, a patch from, from the Google team. So it, basically in 1.4 and 1.5, Kubernetes, just the ARM builds have been, have been using not the official Golang, but a, a custom patched one. This is fixed in uh, one one eight though of Go, so it's good. Now, now we can use one eight, and the, the Golang internal problem has been fixed. Also, PowerPC and S three hundred ninety X is provided now. And as I said, I have a demo cluster. So basically, now I've, I've made. Um, let me see if I where my pointer is. There. So I made a kubeadm workshop re repository on on GitHub, and this is uh, a, well a workshop and a demonstration of what you can do with kubeadm if you want to be on the edge, and I'm, I'm demoing some new features and some really cool ones as well. <laughs> so you can you can go and see here. And it works, the best thing is that it works on multiple architectures. So now I've deployed these cool things that I'm gonna mention soon on, on this multi-platform multi cluster. Yeah, and now I had to, for this demo, I had to use a custom Hypercube image, but normally you wouldn't do this. And but just kubeadm init config with a config file. Then I, I worked on. Well, kubeadm 1.5 was insecure, and if you used it, well, it's alpha, so it had some known security issues. However, in 1.6, where, where we have been working on making, fixing this and making it be the quality, and it went, went pretty well. Kubernetes 1.6 is coming in the next few days, uh, we all hope. And <laughs> um, yeah, but an example that earlier you had full root access to your cluster at localhost 8080. But now you don't anymore. Instead, the admin credentials are written to admin.conf. And if you want to use them, you, you have to set kubeconfig, the environmental variable, to, to that file. And yeah, that makes it much more secure, because no, no, you, you don't want that every host network pod on, on your master it can be it can be good and e both good and evil ones but they would have root access to all the other things on your cluster so well uh, we've apply for this demo or one tricky thing with, with this is that if you have 90% of your images are multi-arch, but 10% only work with on Intel, and you might not even be able to, to control which. Uh, you, you might not even be able to control those those images that are Intel only. Then you have to, to taint the the like non-Intel nodes and a taint. Is, is a thing that ma makes the, the node dedicated, basically. So if the, the only pods that can schedule on, the, on a tainted node are those who have a toleration with the same key value pair. So if I taint P5, this one, no, no pods that, doesn't have, that don't have the toleration for this node can be deployed. So in this case, the default here is schedule on AMD64 only, but those 
the, those pods, on those deployments that I've marked explicitly as multi-arch, ARM and ARM64, will, will be deployed to those. And in, in my demo here, I'm, I'm first deploying the dashboard, then I'm deploying Heapster, the, that is aggregating CPU and memory usage across the cluster. Then I'm deploying Trafik as, as the ingress controller. Also, I'm deploying Engrook. So now I don't have a public IP here to, to the internet, but I've made an, a tunnel to the Engrook service with this and have now exposed uh, a web, the web services I'm running here. The, the web services, well, I've exposed the ingress controller to, to the internet. So, as an example, here is the dashboard. I, I don't care, I don't know where, where the dashboard runs. It, it could be on an ARM node, it could be on the Odroid, or it could be on the Intel upboards. But basically, I don't care. And also Grafana with Heapster. Let's see if I, we get the latest metrics. And yeah, here we have the CPU usage, memory usage from the cluster that are in front of you. And as I said, I don't know where this runs, but Heapster and the dashboard are multi-architecture, so they can run anywhere in this case. And yeah, for, for that to work, I had to deploy the ingress object for, for the dashboard. And yeah, that was on a public IP, those two websites, websites I showed because of the, well, So basically, I mapped, I mapped the, the traffic controller that's running somewhere here to, to this, this URL that's public on the internet with, with basic auths as well and on the dashboard subparts. Yeah, InfluxDB and Grafana for saving the Heapster data. Heapster only keeps the latest five minutes or so in memory, and but it can write to, to Influx and some other stores as well. Then I Prometheus is also multi-architecture. It works on ARM, ARM64, and a lot of a lot of other architectures platforms. And here <coughs> I deploy the, the Prometheus operator from CoreOS and a sample instance. The, the operator is using a third-party resource, which is great. And the, the first talk here uh, at the day was, was described third-party resource as well. It was cool to see. And yeah, this, this is a sample implementation of that as well. Also, I made a, a sample metrics app that, well, just shows this. And yeah, nothing, nothing really exciting, but and some metrics. So that's it. And but one one interesting thing, and a thing you you will notice with my workshop, is that now, well, in in one seven it will be possible to write your own API service and extend the, the core API server really easily. You just run uh, an API server on top of the cluster and the, the core API server will delegate all the requests to a certain, certain API group to that on cluster running API server. And this is the case with custom metrics. So now I had this HTTP requests total. This is a custom metric. This isn't something core. This isn't 
uh, Kubernetes doesn't know anything about this, but yeah, and here you see my what's running in my cluster right now, or when I made the, when I copied this at least, and some services. Grafana, InfluxDB, Engrok, the Trafic, Ingress Controller, my my metrics app, and here the the custom custom metrics API server that's running on top of the cluster. Also, with Hepster, Heapster, you can top uh, use kubectl top and see the memory usage, etc. And basically, if you if you run here is an example that you can you can add a, a API server. You can run an API server on top and you can scale on custom metrics as well with just exposing uh, exposing some metrics of your application and then you can create a, a horizontal pod out of scaler. With, with that and scale based on that data. So that's, that's in my workshop. But that was just a side note. And what's yet to be done for the multi-architecture stuff? Well, automated CI testing, right now we don't have a, a CI system that starts failing when someone breaks ARM compatibility, for example, but we'll hope I hope we'll have in the future. But this, this requires some commercial support as well from an ARM, some, someone that, a company that's interested in using Kubernetes on ARM, for example. Um, and formalize a standard specification how, about how this should, should be built. Also, what's a little bit disappointing is that GCR IO doesn't support ver Docker registry API version 2 schema 2. So that's something that has to be fixed. But, well, that was my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>